joining us on the panel are Peter Chapman, CEO of IonQ, and Ilana Wisby, CEO of Oxford Quantum Circuits. Please help me welcome our panelists. Well, Peter, let's start with you first. IonQ has announced a SPAC merger and its shares will trade on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol IONQ. Tell us more. Uh, that's correct. Um, we have just filed the S4. So we're in the final stages of getting ready to be listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, clearly an important thing to do when you start a company is think about what that future stock symbol is going to be. So we were easy when we had to sit down and think about what our stock symbol was going to be. Um, so, um, so the next is, you know, it's, it's usual process with the SEC to go back and forth. And, um, and then after the SEC process, then it's um, to the final listing. Probably, you know, something like um, 45 days, maybe 60 days from now. Exciting. So tell yeah. us more about IonQ. Um, so we're a trapped ion quantum um, computing company. We make hardware um, that you can find out on uh, AWS or Azure. Um, and, you know, with a $10 and a credit card, you can start quantum computing um, and start your first quantum computing program. It's pretty exciting. Um, so, Ilana, I understand that um, Oxford Quantum Circuits is a spin-out from Oxford U University with Dr. Peter Leake. So, tell us more about that. Absolutely. We, we also build quantum computers. Uh, we build them out of superconducting devices, and that core IP is out of um, Peter Leake's lab in the University of Oxford. We spun out in June of 2017, but we're now fully spun out. We've got our own independent lab and um, we're a team of 25 people. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount of quantum going on in the Oxford ecosystem, but uh, we were the first spin out from, from the uni. And, and what does it mean to be the only commercially available quantum computer in the UK? Absolutely. That means that if, if any customer or end user or reseller wants to come run an algorithm on OQC's quantum computer, we can facilitate that via our um, private cloud access. So in, in both of your cases, these were university spin out technologies. Why do you feel that for deep tech, such as quantum computing, it's so important to have a close partnership with universities and, and labs? Um, Peter? Yeah, um, well, often at the very beginning of these things, it's pure R&D. And so in, in that sense, it's a, it's a difficult space, um, you know, for the same reason that corporations don't invest in pure R&D anymore or very little do, that's usually done in an academic setting and usually with government funding. And so, which, you know, is an appropriate place. And then at, at some point it moves from being an academic uh, endeavor and into a commercial one. And so that's this transition from a university to, um, you know, to a commercial enterprise. In INQ's case, it was University of Maryland and Duke University um, that were the, you know, where the two co-founders came from. Terrific. Ilana, any more thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a, a ton of advantages to, you know, being able to spin out from the universities and maintain a close relationship because in order to, you know, take quantum computing where it's going to go and, and be, you know, full fault tolerant, have the impact that we know it can achieve, there is still going to be a lot of additional innovation um, and the university and IP pipeline as well as a talent pipeline for spin out companies is, is an excellent, um, an excellent resource. Mm. And, and can you tell us um, both, uh, both of you, tell us about your key milestones so far. Why don't we start with you, Ilana? Absolutely. So one of our key milestones was setting up our, our new independent laboratory, which meant that we, we can now operate um, a lot more you know, quickly um, outside from the university, um, which, which we achieved in November of last year. Um, we have now got our first independent you know, uh, end to end um, internal, which is, is available um, for partners. We've done key demonstrations um, with some of our, our key strategic partners, such as River Lane, some of the quantum software companies. We're, we're just on this for some really exciting milestones that I am absolutely not able to talk about, but catch me in three weeks time and I can share some more. Exciting, looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, and Peter, what about you, milestones? Um, well, definitely putting um, our quantum computers out in the cloud and making them easily um, available. Um, it's it's one thing to um, build a quantum computer and run a lab experiment. It's another thing to actually have it run twenty four seven, you know, seven days a week, 
Um, and so um, being commercially available and available all the time is a huge kind of milestone unto mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the next milestones is, is hardware, new hardware coming out and new generations of hardware, new capabilities. Exciting, looking forward to hearing more about that. Um, and, and can you tell us about your investors and why they decided to invest in your company? Peter, why don't we start with you? Um, so originally it was uh, in IonQ's case, it was Google Ventures, NEA, and Amazon mm -hmm. uh, were kind of the lead lead investors. Um, and all of them um, you know, had a strong interest in, in quantum. In fact, actually, um, NEA, which is a little unusual, um, one, uh, Harry Weller from NEA, um, well-known uh, venture capitalist on the East Coast of the United States, um, approached the two founders. Uh, the two founders had written a paper on how to build a, um, you know, a, a scalable quantum computer. So the VCs actually reached out to us, which is kind of unusual. Very. And, uh, <laughs> So we didn't have to chase them for, for money. Um, and that's how the company kind of got started, um, was Harry had read that scientific paper. God knows why he was reading scientific papers, but he read one of Chris and Jung Sang's paper, and he said, hey, this reads just like a business plan, and approached them and said, hey, we'd like to start a company, and that's INQ. Wow, exciting. Elal, tell us about your investors and why they decided to invest. We we have a very standard um, Oxford spin out type cap table. So our incredibly supportive um, lead investor is Oxford Science Innovation. Um, so that's obviously got a very close relationship with Oxford University. Um, we also have Park Walk, who are also very often closely linked with spin outs from from the university ecosystem. Um, so they're kind of our two key investors. Uh, we also have um, IP Group and um, OTIF as well. So standard Oxford. Uh, we will be fundraising um, from May. So we're really excited to now get the opportunity to, to grow and diversify that, that um, investor board also. Fantastic. So, so help us think uh, towards the future for both of your companies. What are, what are some of the next big stones? I know there's not everything is able to be spoken about, but, uh, but just as we think forward, what should we be looking for? Go ahead, Ilana. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so for us, um, it's now, you know, we're, we're rapidly scaling our R&D significantly. And that is also, of course, delivering and continuing to deliver these incredibly high quality processes, but also starting to scale them now as well. So a lot of the background for the R&D that we've got set up right now is, is reaching these um, scaling milestones whilst keeping the quality that achieved with these four qubit devices. So for us, they're algorithmic. Um, we've got them kind of through quantum volume and, and our real goal is to be able to achieve that scale whilst maintaining um, that effective quantum volume or even improving on it, of course, um, as we scale up here. We also um, hope to be able to um, focus on delivering um, impactful algorithms um, so starting to again diversify our, our strategic partners um, and make that more publicly available across the year fantastic peter what about you what should we be looking for in the future here well in in general um you know we're obviously and i think we've said it before we're working on three generations of hardware at the same time when you have more resources you can you can to work on kind of things in parallel so um there's the future announcements about that hardware. Um, in general, in quantum, people are working kind of on several um, things at once. One is uh, improving their native gate fidelity, which is just, um, which allows you to run bigger and bigger programs. Um, and I, in Q's case, we, uh, with the University of Maryland and Duke University, just showed the world's first uh, error-corrected qubit. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing, which means, um, suddenly you can run even bigger programs. So it's it's working on kind of the native gate fidelity, improving the uh, error correction and the number of physical qubits, which just means you can run bigger and bigger. Um, most people think that if you can have, um, you know, roughly 72 qubits that with enough uh, fidelity, that then you can start to take on kind of our early supercomputing or the cloud itself for some applications. So that's what everyone's goal is in the future is how quickly can we get there? Fantastic. So we've got about 10 minutes before we open it up to the investors, but I'm curious about what you found as you've spoken to investors and, and as people begin to think in investing more in this space, what do you wish people understood more uh, and, and you'd like to share uh, with investors that you think might be maybe some misconceptions that they have? Either one. 
<laughs> After you, Peter. Uh, well, um, people have lots of lots of um, viewpoints on where quantum is. Like, uh, I can't tell you the number of times people say, "Oh, uh, it needs to be at zero degrees," and our and our hardware is learning at room temperature. So you know, so it's um, the um, the other one, which is a common, um, I think it's kind of almost fraudulent, is people talking about uh, the number of qubits that they have. And um, because it turns out in quantum computing, there's, you need qubits and you need fidelity. And, um, and, and often we see people who are just talking about one aspect, which is the number of qubits. But the reality is if you, in a quantum computer, is that if your fidelity is, is fixed, even if you have a million qubits, you won't get any more power out of it than if you had only 10. And so um, so I think those are kind of two of the common misconceptions. Um, the other one which we're hoping to change is that computers have to be big. They have to be huge. Um, our current generation of quantum computer, um, it's a, actually a prototype system over at Duke, is now less than a square foot. And so you know, quantum is getting smaller in every generation. It'll be a while before it gets to a cell phone, but, um, you know, probably a long while. But, um, you know, that these things actually, you know, we kind of thinking that within a couple of years, it's going to be about the size of an old IBM, you know, PC desktop, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're planning to do a room temperature rack mounted quantum computer with a photonic interconnects, a new kind of networking, um, you know, within the next three years. So just changing general perceptions, you know, a lot of times if you were to go back in classical computing and you look at some of these early, you know, um, systems, you know, they, they took up an entire floor at a university, right? And those are those pictures we've all seen. Well, that's how quantum computers often are today. Mm -hmm. They take up an entire lab at a university. Um, so what we're working on is, is getting the things down to the point where they're really small. Mm -hmm. So that it's looking more like, um, you know, more like an old IBM PC, that footprint. Interesting. Ilana, what do you wish investors knew? Um, kind of leading off actually one of Peter's first ones there, um, we quite often get the misconception that surely if you put enough qubits in your fridge is going to boil because we do operate, you know, we're operating at 30 milligram, but these things are off the shelf. We partner with these these uh, companies. We've got partnership with Oxford Instruments um, who are already thinking, thinking ahead. So, yeah, they're a little bit larger, but um, there is no concern about fridges boiling. And certainly within the next five, 10 year roadmap from our, our plans and simulations, that's that's not an issue. <laughs> um, I think also um, talking to Peter's point around the number of qubits, and this really does come from there's no clear way of, of uni universal benchmarking systems right now and, and making good comparisons between different systems and different technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a really challenging thing I recognize for investors to, to, to understand. And, and the easiest metric, particularly over the last um, kind of years as, as uh, investors were kind of getting more up to speed and, and more savvy and doing more diligence on the space was number of qubits so yes you do see a lot of people rapidly scaling showcasing large numbers of qubits but say some of the 72 or, or qubit systems that are available today are basically as effective as five really good qubits um, and this kind of nuance is is quite challenging to explain but is, is easily lost <laughs> sure sure um, and, and Ilana what what keeps you at night as an entrepreneur <sighs> What keeps me up at night right now, unfortunately, is COVID. Um, I, I, you know, we're we're working as a team, and for me, what I'm really doing is building this elite team and this elite team mindset um, in everything that everything that we do. Um, and having the team split, you know, we of course have had to adapt. We're working through um, through Slack, but I know that it's having I know that it's having an impact. Um, so I think for me, culturally, that's that's the top of my uh, agenda right now. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to get people back on site completely very, very soon. Um, from a tech perspective, for us, you know, we're going to be fundraising and making sure that we have the resources in place that we can invest them and be successful. Um, and the resources in particular, starting to think about um, the future of the ecosystem and supply chain and making sure that we are both leading that but we've also got a robust supply chain and ecosystem around us oh. um, for, for you know for the potential and managing those different risks i think yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense peter what about you what what keeps you up at night 
Um, but at the maybe what did keep me up at, at night, not so much now, but um, you know, when we started at the beginning of the pandemic, we were um, we had to go kind of into a lockdown because there was this this fear that maybe we'd enter a recession. Mm-hmm. And um, and when you go into a recession, lots of venture capital goes away, right? Indeed. And so um, the concern was is that maybe we wouldn't be able to bring a quantum computer to the market for things that had nothing to do with the technology. It was the background economic that were potential. And um, and I think personally that quantum computing is just as important as solving you know the current urgency to solve COVID because if we can get a big enough quantum computer, we'll probably take on other diseases. Mm-hmm. And so every day that's lost, right, in kind of uh, in producing a quantum computer is a day where we lost people to, you know, um, these horrible afflictions. So the idea that somehow we wouldn't be able to get to a, uh, a big enough quantum computer or bring it to mankind because of external factors that outside of our control was really quite worrying. So, um, and that's one of the reasons we decided to go the SPAC route is we could raise enough money that we could get all the way to the end. And we're now completely in control of our destiny kind of in the future. Terrific. Um, Any last thoughts before we move on to the investors, Uh, Ilana? Final thoughts just generally? Yeah, just about your company or the industry? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's an incredibly, incredibly exciting place to be in, and I'm absolutely privileged to be um, leading OQC into delivering something that can have such a, a tremendous impact. You know, we see a brighter future for humanity, you know, delivered by this type of technology. And, and for OQC, we see that brighter future, and every single one of us is here to help help deliver that. Um, and, yeah, we've got an incredibly exciting year ahead, and, and I'm very excited to find additional people to join us on that journey. Fantastic. Peter, what about you? Any, any thoughts before we move over to the investors? Um, you know, just along the same, same line, it's the next, you know, two years, I think are just a super, super exciting time mm-hmm. as, in terms of quantum and what's going to happen. Um, you know, I think we're at that stage where we're looking for Dan Brick to come up with the, um, the spreadsheet for quantum, the killer app. Yep. So, um, what I love about the fact that uh, these quantum computers are available now out in the cloud is some kid in a garage can be the, the kid that, you know, that helps it. We're looking still for the for Bill Gates to come along and do quantum basic. Right. And so there's just this tremendous opportunity uh, available to to everyone. It's kind of as big as the Internet uh, was to or the mobile computing. Every time there's a new wave of technology, mm. there's this just it's highly disruptive, but it also creates, you know, tremendous opportunities for people to create incredible companies. And so we're at that beginning right now, Phantom. So it's a really exciting time. Really exciting. Thank you both so much for, for this very interesting conversation. 